So, uh, like I said, it's been several weeks. I think it actually was back in April when I looked at it. It's a little, little further back than I thought. So I just wanted to quickly recap what we looked at in lesson number one. But let's read the text that we began with last time. In uh, 1 Corinthians 16, verse number one, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given to the order to the churches of Galatia, even so do you, do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there uh, be no gatherings when I come. So we were, we've been examining church order and the various aspects of, of you know, a typical church service and the kind of things that we're involved in. And we've, been, we've, we've seen again and again the amount of liberty that God gives us in the New Testament church, but we're just wanting to understand well, what, what things are important? What things are, we, do we need to make sure we aren't overlooked in the process of this? And so one of the things that we do here regularly every Lord's Day is we receive an offering. And so is that biblical? We're, we're, we're examining that. And we see here that they were, in fact, uh, there was instruction given by the apostle to the church at Corinth to lay aside the first day of the week as God has prospered you. So this is a portion of what you have. It was a percentage, um, you know, based on how uh, God had prospered each one and they were to lay it aside. Now, this is not instruction to give a regular weekly offering. That's not what this particular one is about. Verse number three says, And when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, them will I send to bring your liberality unto to Jerusalem. Um, you, if we won't go there for time's sake, but if you go to Romans 15, 26, you'll see that they were uh, taking up a collection for the poor in Jerusalem. This was a, an offering for a specific need. But it does establish the fact that they were, that they were giving, uh, giving of their resources for the benefit of the church and for God's glory. We found out last time that the word tithe, which literally means tenth, is really more of an Old Testament term. That's not established in the New Testament church. It's set forth very clearly in the law, and we looked at one of the key passages concerning the tithe. Um, in the New Testament, it's only mentioned just a couple of times, once related to the Pharisees when he said, you know, you tithe mint and anise and all these things, but you overlook the weightier matters of the law. These things ought you have done and not overlook these other matters. Um, so it's used there in that context. And then the other place it's mentioned is in Hebrews where we find that Abraham gave a tenth to Melchizedek, who is a who is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And so when Abraham tithed into Melchizedek, it signified that uh, this one was greater than Abraham. And so uh, we just touched on this briefly last time, but I said this is an important point because Abraham tithed to Melchizedek and by extension to the Lord prior to the law. Right. And so we look at Abraham and we look at the things that he was involved in prior to the law, prior to circumcision, and we see him as our great example of faith. Um, it, we, we go back to Abraham. Paul does that again and again uh, to emphasize our, our faith, that the issue is faith in Jesus Christ. It's not in works of the law, not in not in any works, lest, lest any should boast. But. Uh, salvation is by faith. And so Abraham is used as that example of faith over and over again. And so he, this tithing, he did this before the law established that requirement, before it was a command in the law. And then we finished, we said, even though there's no detailed instruction concerning, uh, uh, you know, a, a tithe or anything like that that we had in the Old Testament, this principle of giving is very much a New Testament concept. And our great example for that is none other than Christ himself. When we read in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, where it says, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. And so he is our example in Christian giving. And so that's where we left off last time. I want to I just pick back up um, with this idea of Abraham and briefly re revisit that. Like I said, he is an example before the law as a pattern for us to follow. Uh, Romans 4.12 says this concerning believers. It says that they are those who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham. So he is a pattern for us. We look to Abraham and follow that example of faith. And so we noted last time that Abraham gave to Melchizedek, who was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, before instructed to do so by the law. And so I would suggest that he is an example for us to follow in that giving, right? Because I want us to understand this. When we give of our resources to the Lord, when we give this offering to the Lord of our resources, that is an act of faith in and of itself, right? We're saying by faith, 
Lord, I don't need all of this to survive. I'm not trusting in my paycheck to survive. I'm not trusting in my stuff to survive. The reason that I'm sustained is because of God, right? And so that's what we're declaring when we give a portion back to God. We're giving to God in thanksgiving. We're giving to God for His glory. And we're saying, God, you can sustain me without this piece here. Now, the world says you got to pinch every penny, right? you got to put everything that, if you're not using it now, you got to put it back in your 401k or something for your retirement because you just never know. But the Christian says, no, I'm giving a portion back to God and thanksgiving to Him because that's not what's going to sustain me. That's not what's going to keep me. What is going to keep me is God Himself. Um, when the Lord first uh, laid on my heart about I was too busy and I went part time at work, that was the issue. It's like I had to understand that the pay, my paycheck was not what was sustaining me and my family from week to week. God was who was sustaining me. And so when you come to grips with that, you realize God can take care of you in whatever way that He sees fit. He does exceedingly abundantly above that which we could ask or think, right? So the storehouses of heaven belong to God. There is no uh, shortage in His ability. And the thing that the believer knows is what Proverbs 23, 5 says. And let's read that one. This is a good text, a good verse for us to remember. Lest we fall into the temptation of setting our hearts upon riches... We know the Scripture teaches that it is the love of money that is the root of all evil. Not the money itself, but the love thereof. And we need to understand something about riches. Verse number 4 of Proverbs 23 says, Labor not to be what? Rich. Rich. That's not the emphasis. That's not the focus. Cease from thine own wisdom. He says, Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. They're here and then they're gone. They can be gone just like that, right? Um, and so if, our, if we're trusting in that, that is an uncertain thing to trust in. But if we're trusting in God who cares for His own, that is a steadfast and a sure Hope And so we give in faith to God because He is worthy. We give in faith to God because uh, we are thankful for what He has provided. And, uh, and so we see multiple examples of that in the New Testament. Look at Luke 21. In Luke 21, we give uh, like the woman does here in, in the example that the Lord gives us as He's beholding those that came and casted their uh, gifts into the treasury. He saw the rich man giving their gifts, and he saw in verse number 2 of Luke 21, a certain poor widow uh, casting in thither two mites. And he said, Of a truth I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all, for all these have of their abundance cast in uh, unto the offerings of God, but she of her penury, or she of her poverty, hath cast in all the living that she ha had. So what did this woman understand? She understood that it's not those, uh, 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 how much does it say? Uh, those two mites, it's not those two mites that are going to sustain me, it's God. It's the God that provided the two mites and will provide that which is necessary for me. And so that we see an act of faith there as she gives to the Lord. And the world, of course, looks at that and says, are you crazy? Right? Really? You're crazy. But not if you're trusting in God. Right? It's like Elijah coming to the widow woman. What must that have seemed like, you know, to her when God says the brook dries up and uh, it's interesting, you can look at it when you've got more time in 1 Corinthians 17, 9. God says, Elijah, arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. Well, you kind of wonder when you get over there and Elijah starts talking to this woman, did she get the memo, right? Because Elijah comes over there and he says, what are you doing? And she says, I'm gathering sticks here because I got a little bit of oil and I got a little bit of meal and I'm going to make a couple of cakes and me, me and my son are going to eat those and then we're going to die because that's all we've got. And Elijah says, well, when he first comes up to him and asks for a little water and you know, if you're in that state, even a little bit of water is a big deal, right? And, he's, and when, he, he, when she tells him that, he says, well, make a little cake for me first. First, what? Are you crazy? And it's just a little cake, but when you're about to make your last meal, a little's a lot. Amen? But she did. And in, and in sustaining the Lord's servant and thereby offering to the Lord, what was the result? She and her son were sustained. The cruise of oil and the meal, it never failed. It sustained them throughout that time of famine. And so 
We see that those that give by faith to the Lord, they're recognizing that it's not that stuff. It's not the oil and the meal that's going to sustain me and my child. She understood that. It's the God of the oil and the meal. It's the God of this prophet. And so as she gave to God by providing for the Lord's servant, she and her son were sustained. How important is giving in the New Testament? We've got some tremendous examples of that, and I want you to see that in Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. In Acts 4, in verse number... Let's just back up a little bit so we can see the oneness and the unity of the, of the early church here. The, this, this is, you want to see what the church is supposed to look like? You go back and look at the church in our infancy before uh, in, anything outside had influence and, and got inside there. And um, here it is. Here's the pattern of, of the believers as they come together. Verse 32, And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that all of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold. I think of James that says, you know, your faith, we've been talking about faith, your faith is, is exhibited by your works. Faith without works is what? Yeah. Is dead. I, I think it was James, but I may be getting confused. Maybe it's in, in 1 John. But he talks about, uh, you know, if your brother comes to you and he's naked, he's destitute, he has no food, and you say, well, God bless you, be you warmed and filled, and you send him away with nothing. There's no evidence of faith there, right? That wasn't an issue here. Uh, there was no lack. They looked out for one another. They cared for one another. And so it says they, they sold what they had and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas. This is the Barnabas that went on that first missionary journey with Paul, which is, be, uh, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. And so, a tremendous example of giving here in the early church, the oneness that they had, the way that they cared for one another, the way that no, nobody looked at their stuff as being their own but they looked out for the body of Jesus Christ and they gave uh, to the church and they entrusted it to those that were called to lead them. Look at John chapter 12. John chapter 12, I want you to see Mary here also as a great example of Christian giving. In John chapter 12, how important is giving in the New Testament? Here's another great example of giving, tremendous example of giving in the New Testament. And I want you to see here, the issue with giving, you know, we started off our text in 1 Corinthians 16 where they were taking up a collection for the poor saints that were in Jerusalem. The issue is not always the poor. And we see that here in this text. Um, John chapter 12, it says, Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, which had been dead, uh, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. And we know, of course, Judas had an issue with that. And he complained and said, this should have been given to the poor. But Christ rebukes him. His heart's exposed for us in verse number 6. And we understand he was a thief. He didn't really care about the poor. He just wanted his hands on the money. But Jesus rebukes him and says that, uh, let her alone in verse 7, against the day of my burying, she has she kept this for the poor always ye have with you, but me Ye have not always. And so the issue is not always the poor, but the issue is doing that which God leads you to do. This widow woman was commanded of the Lord to sustain this prophet, whether she knew it or not until she was in that circumstance. She had been commanded of God to do that. And here Mary has this burden upon her heart, and so the giving flows out of that. It flows out of a love to God as we're prompted by the Holy Ghost to give for the purposes that God has determined. Um, how important is giving? For some, giving is the main issue, right? And we won't go there for time's sake. You're familiar with the story of the rich young ruler. What was the issue? 
Uh, what must I do to, be, to have eternal life? And Jesus starts listing the things, you know, honor your father, mother, the different commandments there. And he says, I've kept all these things from my youth. And Jesus said, you're lacking one thing. You're not trusting in God. You're trusting in your riches. Go and sell everything that you have and give it to the poor and come follow me and, and you'll have eternal riches. But we know what he did. He went away sorrowful. The giving for him was the main issue, right? That's how important giving is. For some, it may be the main issue. So uh, giving is very much, uh, Christian giving is very much established in the New Testament. It's not simply an Old Testament concept. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 9. If we had time, we'd read this entire chapter. I would encourage you to, to read it. Uh, actually, 2 Corinthians 9, 8 and 9 are both excellent chapters concerning this giving. And we're going to, as we look at this over the next week or so, we're going to come back and revisit some verses in this uh, passage. But uh, it, it shows giving here, giving for the poor, it establishes that. It establishes the desire for equality among believers. It establishes the fact that we ought to give cheerfully. But I want you to see how giving is referred to here in uh, 2 Corinthians 9 and in verse number 6. It's, it, is, uh, it is compared to sowing. And we are sowing in the kingdom of God as we give. And 2 Corinthians 9 verse number 6 says... Um, well, let's back up just so we can see the context and so that you understand we're not speaking out of line here. 2 Corinthians uh, 9, 1 so it says, For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you, uh, because I know the forwardness of your mind. I know how that you were ready to give and to provide for these that were in need. Uh, but he said, I'm going to send someone to you ahead of time so that when they come to receive this gift that you promised, that you've got it ready. Uh, verse number 5 says, Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty whereof ye had, no, had noticed before, that the issue might be ready as a matter of bounty and not as of covetousness. So uh, he's sending someone to get them ready to give this gift that they have promised in the past for the benefit, benefit of these poor saints. But he makes this statement here in verse number 6. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. So I want you to see that there's no set percentage. We saw that when we looked at 1 Corinthians 16. Everyone gave according as God had blessed them, right? Uh, they gave a percentage of that which they had according to the blessing of God, a proportion, some portion of that. So there's no percentage given here, but we do see uh, that it's pointed out that blessing is associated with and in proportion with our giving. Now, the health and wealth gospel preachers, they'll take that and run with it, right? And they say, you got to give me more money so God will give you more money back. That's not what we're talking about. And if you're given for that reason, then your giving's not even accepted of God, right? But there is a point that's established here, and to me it's this. You cannot outgive out -give God. You cannot outgive God. The widow woman gave her last little bit there, and the oil and the mill never failed her. We've been reading about uh, uh, Samuel with the boys at home. And Hannah, she, gets, she says, God, if you will just give me a child, I will give him back to you. And she does. And guess what? God gives her five more children. I mean, you can't outgive him. Uh, the, the apostle said, Lord, we've forsaken all and we've followed you. What shall we receive? And he said, there's nobody that's given up lands, you know, family, all of these things that I, they, I will not restore to them a hundredfold in this life with persecutions, right? It's not a bed of roses that we're talking about. But the greater blessing is that in the world to come, guess what? Eternal life. You cannot outgive God. And so to me, that's in its simplicity what this verse establishes here. Blessing is associated with and in proportion with giving. You invest little in the kingdom of God, then you're going to get little return from that. Investing much in the kingdom of God will reap great rewards. And so as we read on down, we begin to understand some of the blessings that they reap through this giving. Look at verse number 10. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness, and increase in your righteousness. 
You see the spiritual blessings that are established there? Um, it's not, I, I told, I've told you guys before, where uh, uh, over there in Ephesians, I, was, I read a little bit of Joel Osteen's book, Your Best Life Now, right? Uh, and uh, I was forced into that. I didn't want to, but I was forced into it. And you read the first chapter, and he takes that verse in Ephesians 1 that talks about how God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. And I guess he just marked out spiritual. His mind just jumped right over that, you know, and he said, hey, you want that house in Hawaii? God wants you to have that house. You know, you just picture yourself there and you'll have that. It's the spiritual blessings, right? The scripture says God's children aren't set on these natural material things. So what are you talking about that that's the emphasis and the issue? You know what? If you need a house in Hawaii, if God says you're going to be there to minister to my saints, then God will provide the house, right? But <laughs> for most of us, that's not the issue, right? Or the need. And so here we see those spiritual blessings that God is pouring out upon them. Increase the fruits of your righteousness, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. One of the great benefits that's going to come from your giving is thanksgiving uh, of the saints of, of Jesus Christ to the Lord as, as, as they give thanks to their God for the administration of this service not only supplieth the one of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgiving unto God. What a blessing that is. Is, right? What a blessing to see a, a gathering of thankful believers. This is part of the blessing that they reap in, in this uh, significant investment in the kingdom. Whilst by the experiment of this ministration, they glorify God. It's going to redound to the glory of God. And isn't that what every true child of God wants? Uh, it's going to glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men. And by their prayer for you. Hey, guess what else? Guess what other blessing you're going to reap? The church is going to pray for you. They're going to shower you with prayers and bring you before the throne of grace, which long after you for the exceeding grace of God in you. And so he says, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Man, that's a far greater value than anything money can buy. Amen. There's no, you can't put a price on that. So you cannot out give God. That is the simple principle there. That's true in any way, in any way in which we give to the Lord, whether we're serving the saint or whether we're serving the sinner. And I want to finish with that thought in Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Whether we're serving the believer or the unbeliever. In Luke chapter 6 and verse number 35. The Lord says, but love ye your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for what? Nothing, Nothing again. I'm not given to give back. This idea of I'll scratch your back and you scratch mine, that's foreign in the kingdom of God, right? Jesus Christ laid down his life selflessly. Uh, we saw that about though he were rich, he became poor for your sake. So love your enemies. And do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And guess what? Your reward shall be great. You cannot outgive God. It doesn't matter if nobody notices. Guess who does? God notices, right? Your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest. Guess what? You're going to look like your Savior when you act this way. You're going to look like Jesus Christ when you act this way. For he is kind unto the thankful, unthankful, and to the evil.